Hi agroecologists, it's Randy. I'm out here at the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial to talk about the importance of diversity in agricultural systems. And what better place than WIXT to talk about this. What you see over here on my right is an alfalfa stand that's been harvested a couple of weeks ago probably, so there's been some regrowth. Growing in and among the alfalfa are various clovers and grasses that uh, either were planted or just volunteered. And they're contributing to the diversity of that system. If it were just a pure stand of alfalfa, then we would say that that system had little to no diversity. But the inclusion of some clover and grass into that stand uh, allows us to have some diversity. On the other hand, the corn field that you see over here off to my right has essentially no diversity. There's one species, we'll call that a monoculture. These are polycultures because they have more than one species. Over here on my left is a stand of uh, clover that's been planted into as a cover crop along with some uh, oats that are coming up and they're going to provide cover for that system through the winter. Again, that's adding diversity to the system. Now I want to talk about three levels of resolution, spatial resolution for diversity. Field level, and that'd be the kind of diversity we have within this field that you see behind me. Farm level, which would be across an entire farm. As you can imagine, a farm has multiple fields. And so the number of different types of fields is an important metric of field level, of, excuse me, farm level diversity. And then finally, a level of spatial resolution that we'll call landscape level uh, diversity. And Claudio will talk to us more about landscape level diversity and it's important for agricultural systems. So we mentioned field, farm, and landscape level diversity. Ecologists would refer to these with some arcane language like alpha diversity, that would be field level diversity, beta level diversity, that would be farm level diversity, uh, in eco ecological terms, it'd be talking about the number of different patches in a landscape. And then landscape level diversity would be the number of different uh, ecosystems within a landscape. And we'll call that gamma diversity uh, as far as ecologists go. So uh, when we look at diversity, uh, the simplest way to quantify that is species richness, if we're talking about species. Uh, and so when I look at this stand of alfalfa, uh, I would end, I would want to delineate a particular unit of area and count the number of different species or the number of unique species. And that would give me an, uh, an a metric that we call species richness. So here in this plot, I might consider that there is alfalfa, clover, and Kentucky bluegrass. There probably are more grasses, but let's just say that there's only Kentucky bluegrass. So I see three species per meter squared. That's an estimate of the species richness of this stand. You can imagine I might do another meter squared plot over here, count the number of species. And if I did that across this field, on average, I would find three species per meter squared. There's not a lot of variation. Now, uh, what I also might look at is how evenly distributed are those species within that one meter squared. And so if I looked at a one meter squared plot here, I might make some quantification and decide and, and, and determine about a third of it is clover, about a third of it is grass, and about a third of it is alfalfa. That's a perfectly even stand in terms of uh, diversity. And so evenness is a metric that we often use. Looking over at the cornfield, you can imagine if I looked at the same spatial resolution, a meter squared, almost all of it would be corn. Now there might be a weed here and a weed there. So the species richness might still be three species per meter squared, but the evenness of that stand would be very skewed. Almost all the abundance would be the corn plant. And there are a few other species. And so these are two very important metrics uh, of diversity when we think about how we estimate and quantify diversity at the field level. Now it's not only species diversity that we care about. Sometimes folks are interested in genetic diversity. 
how many unique uh, genetic variations are there in a particular stand of alfalfa, for instance, might be the kind of thing we look at. Um, sometimes we're interested in plant trait diversity, and that goes to uh, how much variety might there be in the width of leaves? How much variety might there be in the depth of roots? How much variety might there be in root architecture? The, the list goes on and on. It's almost infinite. The number of different traits of plants that we might quantify and then ascribe to their variation and hence their diversity. Uh, in addition, it might just be that we're interested in a higher level of taxonomic resolution. Maybe we don't care about species. Maybe we're really interested in families, the uh, diversity of plant families. So the point here is just that species diversity tends to be the one that we talk about, but it really can be any level of taxonomic resolution. And it doesn't even have to be taxonomic. It can be genetic. It can be plant traits, etc. One of the reasons that diversity metrics are useful for us as agroecologists is, really, is that they uh, help us quantify and uh, relate to a long outstanding question in ecology uh, that's also relevant for agroecology. And that is what is the relationship between diversity and something like productivity, an ecosystem function like NPP? the amount of biomass that's produced. So we're interested in how diversity is related to ecosystem functions, like the amount of production that there is by the plants, but it might also be other ecosystem functions like the rate of decomposition of dead plant material. It might be uh, other ecosystem functions like the amount of nitrogen that's retained in, this, in the system the amount of nitrogen that's lost as a gas, the amount of nitrogen that's lost as in an aqueous phase, the amount of phosphorus that runs off, the amount of soil that runs off. These are all ecosystem functions that um, are relatable to metrics of diversity. And so one of these longstanding questions in ecology has been, uh, how does diversity relate to these various ecosystem functions? So now we're here in front of a prairie that's been restored here at Wext. And what better way to talk about diversity than a prairie, which is, of course, one of the most diverse um, plant communities that we can think of. And this particular prairie has been grazed historically. It's been burned. It's been cut. So there's a lot of disturbance that happens to it. Uh, and that part of that is trying to maintain the diversity of this particular plant community. The diversity of this community uh, is um, relatively high for a prairie. But what we find is that as we move into soils and environments where uh, productivity overall is lower, so you can imagine as we move west in the United States, where there's less rainfall available, resource limitation is very strong there. What we tend to see in those environments is that the effect of diversity on productivity is quite pronounced. And so in uh, at, at, at dry ends of productivity gradients, uh, the effects of diversity are more important than at wetter, more productive ends of uh, a resource gradient or, a, or a, uh, a moisture gradient. So here at Wix, we're at really the most productive end of the moisture gradient. We get a lot of rain here in relative terms. We get a lot of rain here. The soils are very productive. Uh, and so resource limitation isn't as high here as it is in other places. As a result, what we see is that the effects of diversity aren't as pronounced. Now, the reason that we think that diversity might lead to a positive effect on ecosystem process like uh, net primary productivity is that the diversity of the species allows for what's known as niche complementarity. And niche complementarity simply means that the more different species there are with their various different plant traits, the more completely they're exploring the resource space. So for instance, below ground, you can imagine, uh, you've got some plants in here that have a shallow root architecture. You've got some that have a deep root architecture. You've got some that grow really fast. You've got some that grow really slow. That variety or diversity of plant traits that's the result of the diversity of the taxon uh, taxonomy, um, allows the resource pool to be explored more completely. And as a result, that system tends to be, to be more productive than when you have, say, a pure stand, a monoculture stand, 
that maybe has a shallow root zone, maybe it has a deep root zone. Nonetheless, they're only explore, those plants are only exploring a particular part of the resource space. And so on average, you would expect those uh, stands to be less productive. So while diversity has clearly been related to productivity and it's an important uh, sort of relationship for us to continue to explore, uh, there are reasons beyond productivity that diversity might be important to us. For example, some of us just like diversity. Some of us like a nice diverse stand of prairie. Some of us like to uh, mix one species with another when we're doing our agricultural practices, when we're doing our farming systems. That's a good enough reason. Those are cultural ecosystem services that we enjoy from the environment around us. In addition, there might be other ecosystem services like there might be more abundance of pollinators in this type of uh, plant community than in a more simplified monoculture type, uh, plant community. There might be more birds. I know that compared to the alfalfa stand I was just standing in, the sound behind me of uh, insects and crickets and birds is much higher than it was just five minutes ago when I was standing in front of another system. So you can imagine that the diversity of the plant community also translates to a more diverse fauna living in and within that plant community. And these are really important things for uh, lots of people. And in addition to more diversity, uh, maybe being related to more productivity, uh, that's one metric of productivity. But another metric of productivity might be how stable your yields are from one year to the next. And so one of the things that we're interested in is whether or not diversifying our agricultural cropping systems might actually make them more resistant and resilient to shocks to the system, perturbations to the system. Shocks to the system might include drought, flooding, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. All manner of things that are going to uh, result in uh, big yield losses usually. And uh, so what we think is that more diverse systems tend to uh, uh, help give us some sort of level of insurance against those types of uh, events. And so that's one of the reasons that we like to um, consider diversifying agricultural systems, just like you might diversify your investment portfolio. There's insurance there so that if one particular crop gets hit hard, at least you have other cropping systems uh, to help you get through that trying period. So generally speaking, diversifying our agricultural systems should be considered a good thing. Whether it's diversifying them at the field level, diversifying them at the farm level, say from plot to plot or patch to patch, or diversifying at the landscape level. Generally speaking, it's a good thing. Is it always gonna result in more yields? Probably not. In some situations it might, in some situations it might not. But you might consider it a good insurance portfolio just like you would consider uh, a diverse in investment portfolio a good idea. You might call it good sense 